participating, making the t-shirts, to get together. I had a couple of people approach me, uh, uh, so Nilafar and Jason Close. Are you guys here? Yeah. But I just wanted people who, you know, if you're also interested, maybe you... I, I, can anybody else? If, if there are other people who are interested, can you raise your hand so I kind of... So you can see each other and kind of... Uh, start gelling into a group, oh, yeah. a couple yeah, of groups. Right, right. So who is, uh, okay, so Nilafar over here, and then Jason over here, and, okay. and, and uh, participating in a uh, design t-shirt, uh, okay, so right here. So please try to get together, try to uh, uh, organize the design it doesn't have to be that formal, but just you know, leave it to you guys. It doesn't mean you have to work in groups, but just uh, you know, different people have different expertise. Some ideas, some of the Okay, let's get started. Uh, next we have uh, the third and final talk from Steve Title at the University of Rochester on the topic of uh, uh, driven granular systems and jamming. And this topic today is shared driven granular materials. Okay. Uh, sound is okay? There. Uh, can you, no. 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 I sound Maybe you should try to make it point upwards. Yeah, but this is not so easy. Yeah. Yeah. Is that better? No. No. <laughs> 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 Is that better? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay, for so everyone. I think you can just increase your voice. Huh? You can just increase your voice. Increase my voice? <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, so I want to tell you today about shear driven granular materials. Uh, in contrast to the previous two talks, this is the one I am working on. But I still may not be an expert. Uh, when in the first talk, we discussed a lot about creating a jam state by compressing the granular material. Here, we're going to talk about what happens when you apply a shear to it. Uh, and so, I have a little model here, the same machine I showed you last time. And here's my granular material, two dimensions, two different sizes of particles. And it's in a fixed volume. And I'm going to shear it. And this is constructed so that the area is not changing. So the density and packing fraction is not changing. And I'm going to shear it. And if I can have a volunteer from the audience, maybe I'll share it. I would like you to push very gently on this thing, keeping that not wiggling much, and tell me what you feel. Not much. Not much. <laughs> Good. That's what you're supposed to not feel. The point is that... What may, what's the difference between a liquid and a solid? Okay, most liquids and most solids. The granular material is a little different. If you try and compress your average liquid, what happens? Every time you step on the brake, you're doing this. What happens? Not much. It pushes back. And a liquid does that, and a solid does that, and for most ordinary materials, you can't really tell for sure if you've got a solid or a liquid just by squeezing it. The granular material is of course different because when it's in its liquid-like state, the pressure is zero and it's infinitely compressible. But the way you can tell a more normal material, whether it's a, a liquid or a solid, is to shear it. Because a liquid will, when you do that, the liquid flows, just like here. Okay? You see the particles at the top of the cell are moving with some velocity and the ones on the bottom are, then it's flowing. And if you shear a solid, it doesn't flow. It distorts a little bit, then it pushes back, and it will stay still. So what I'm going to do now is increase the number of particles in this cell. Okay. And again, I ask our volunteer from the audience to step up. And now, <laughs> Share that system. 
and tell everybody what to do. It's a lot more resistance. A lot more resistance. And if you pushed it in the limit of just very gentle pushing, it does what? It doesn't go. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I've never met him before. <laughs> But, but it does go if I push hard enough on it. And then when I push hard enough on it, it will release a little bit, slide for a little bit, and then seize up again, and I'll have to push more, and it'll flow. The main point here is that there's a finite, this is the jam state, okay? It has a finite rigidity, and to get it to flow, I have to exert a shearing stress which is above some critical value. Okay, the yield stress of the material. So that's my jam. Uh, shear applied to a granular material. And if there are any experimentalists in the audience who want to make me a much better version of this, I'd really like it because there's a lot of friction in here that shouldn't be there. Uh, when I wanted to make this, I went to my department machinist and said, Can you build me this? And he said, Sure, $500. And I said, Well, I think I can do it better. <laughs> Cheaper than myself. Uh, but if there are people really who do better than that. So this is an experiment of Bob Berenger at uh, Duke. And what he has here is um, granular material between two cylindrical walls. And the inner wall, he's going to rotate with some fixed angular uh, speed. And that's going to uh, shear the material. All right. And these discs that are on the brand material are photoelastic materials. Namely, they change color or polarization or they do something according to the amount of stress they feel. So in this color coding, the blue areas are regions where there's not much stress, and the red areas are where there is stress. So as he shears it, you see these like percolating fingers of stress uh, spanning the system from here. There. And here's a little move. Whoops, I'm going to do that. Here's a movie of that rotating. As it's rotating, you can see the, the lines of stress are changing. And here's the same thing uh, blown up so you can see the discs of the upper eyes. And as you see, as it's rotating, these lines of stress are going throughout the system. Okay? Uh, the, the stress lines seem to have a particular direction on average. Yes, they want to be, you know, between the two walls to block it from flowing. But since I'm rotating, I'm forcing it to flow anyway, so I'm always exceeding mm -hmm. what the force of those force chains are and causing it to flow. Yeah. How is stress applied? I don't know. Uh, the contact forces here, for example. The, the, these red things are measuring the contact forces. Uh, is that a question, or I'm not talking loud enough? Yeah, please be loud Louder. Okay, all right. Well, uh, I also want to tell you today that uh, what we're really talking about here is not just granular materials like this. It has uh, application to much wider variety of systems. So I have here some other material, which you might recognize, right? <laughs> that is shaving cream, which I don't need anymore since I'm not talking anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and as you can see, this blob of shaving cream is perfectly solid, right? It's not a liquid. It's not flowing over the edge of the view graph projector. It is just sitting there. Uh, but if I I have never done this before. If I <laughs> apply a shear stress, you'll obviously see that it flows quite <laughs> I don't know what you mean, but I see. <laughs> it flows quite nicely under, there we go, we can squish it back the other way. And anyone who wants can play with this after that. <laughs> okay, that's that. Oops, we can move Uh, so, okay, so what I'll talk to you today is about some actual work I'm doing. 
Uh, my collaborators in this project is Peter Olson from Wumio University in Wumio, Sweden, and Daniel Valdez Valdez from the University of Rochester, who has since moved on to Akhenaten. And what I will try to do is first introduce you what is the jamming phase diagram, <coughs> a scaling onslaught score, trying to describe what happens at the jamming transition. And I'll tell you the results of some numerical simulations we've done in two dimensions where we apply a finite fixed strain rate and then some other simulations uh, in the limit of quasi-static and slow shearing. Question? Yeah, just to clarify, I thought you had said in previous lectures that these are all T equals zero systems. Correct. But you're considering a scaling as of, at T equals zero. Yes. So, um, is there any notion of T not equal to zero? Yes, and I'll say that a little bit. Oh. <laughs> uh, okay, so I'll pause that, and I'll tell you what we found out. Okay, so here's my sort of canonical idea about a jam uh, granular material, and I'm going to apply a shearing force, and like you saw in real life over there, it starts to flow, it has a linear velocity profile going from bottom to top. Uh, Here's an example of the shaving cream, but blown up. This is a foam. What's a foam? A foam is a lot of gas bubbles, usually of all different sizes, embedded in some dilute liquid. And this is being sheared, and you see it flowing. If I reduce the shear stress on these plates, this foam would ultimately seize up below some critical shearing threshold and behave like an elastic material. Yes? Is the definition of jamming in this context? Because clearly there's not force balance. Well, the jamming is when it seizes up and stops moving. Okay, so as I said, if I decrease the shear stress at some critical yield stress, it would stop flowing. Right? And so the phase diagram that these examples show you, you can imagine is something like this. Here's the packing fraction. Here's the applied shear stress. In what I talked about in the first two lectures, we were always just on this axis, whereby if I compress the system, increasing the packing fraction, I hit a point, 5J, where the system jammed. And now I can turn on the other axis of shear stress, and what I showed you is that if I'm in the jam state here, where nothing's moving, and I apply shear stress, nothing moves, until the shear stress gets to some critical value, the yield stress, and then for stronger stresses, it will flow, just like it did down here. And so in this phase plane, there's obviously some phase boundary to yield stress, and it presumably vanishes at that same point, the jamming transition. Okay, it's not immediately obvious that the point where it jams up under compression is the same point where it jams up when you do this limiting of shear, but it appears to be so. Okay? Uh, all right. So that's the yield stress. This critical point viewed in this phase diagram has been called by some people point J, the jamming transition. And now we can say, although in these systems temperature isn't important because the particles are so big, I can imagine, what if I turned on temperatures? What if my particles were more microscopic or something and thermal fluctuations would be important? And so Lou and Nagel proposed the following jamming phase diagram, where we've now added another axis of temperature. Uh, just to point out, this axis here is 1 over 5. So the jam then states are down here, and the flowing states are over here. And this is the yield stress line in the zero temperature plane. And extending it to this three-dimensional space where temperature is now included, they imagine that there will be a surface in this plane, such that all states below it are jammed, and all states above it are unjammed. Uh, and then, why this would be interesting, here's the yield stress line at zero temperature. But if I look in the equilibrium plane of temperature and packing fraction, there might also be a line of transitions where that plane intersects the equilibrium plane. And that would be a transition from a liquid state to a rigid but disordered solid state as you vary, not packing fraction or applied stress, but as you vary temperature. And what systems do we know do that? ordinary glasses, right? A glass is some liquid, and you cool down the temperature, the viscosity grows, 
it appears to diverge at some glass transition temperature, and then below it, it appears to be rigid. Okay? When there really is a glass transition at finite temperature is, I think, one of the really big unresolved questions, either experimentally or theoretically. Uh, and so the idea here is that by looking at this jamming transition and pointing, uh, turning on temperature, maybe if we can analyze things here very well, we could say something uh, about what this glassy-like behavior is like. Okay, so that's the glass transition up here. Uh, I'm not going to say anything about that today. I'm going to just think strictly in the zero temperature plane. Uh, the other point they made is that this point J, the jamming transition, viewed in this phase diagram, is a very special point. It's where this yield stress line ends. It's where this glass line that exists ends. And so it's a special point, and Nuenagel proposed uh, that this might be a critical point, like we know in equilibrium phase transition. So even though this is not an equilibrium system, it's at zero temperature, and when we apply a stress, we get driven non-equilibrium steady states. Again, not equilibrium. Nevertheless, they suggested that maybe uh, it's behaving just like a critical point, like we know in ordinary equilibrium uh, phase transitions. And if so, the behavior at this point J would influence the whole region of this phase diagram about it. And that's our goal. We're going to do that and see if we can find evidence for critical scaling. And I'll explain what that is in a little bit at point J. And so what we're trying to do is just test this idea that behavior at this point J behaves like we expect at a critical second order phase transition critical point in ordinary uh, systems. Okay. So here's the jamming diagram again. I'm only talking about zero temperature. Here's the yield stress, jam state, liquid like state, applied shear stress. We can look at that phase diagram, well, we call you differently. Uh, let me draw contours here. These contours here would be contours where the strain rate, okay, that is, if you think of moving walls, that's related to the speed with which you move the walls, where the strain rate is constant. So in the unjammed strain, if you apply a strain rate, you get very little shear. It's, it's flowing. And then as you approach the jam states, as you apply the same slow strain rate, the shear shoots up, right, because the yield stress is high. And so we can look at that phase diagram not as a function of shear stress, but as a function of shear strain rate. And this whole jammed region collapses to a line like this. Right? That's all jammed. And anything at a fine, finite shear strain rate, gamma dot, is by definition flowing. All right? And these contours of constant gamma dot are just now straight lines. If you look at a picture like this, and you come from a background of critical phenomena, you immediately say Ising model, right? And the analogy you would make would be that uh, the, where is it? Well, the packing fraction like this is playing a role like temperature. And as I, uh, well, this would be like increasing, decreasing temperature, hitting a critical point, and then getting the ordered state. And when I turn on the shear strain rate, that's like turning on a magnetic field. And you find a magnetic field, you're already out of the critical region. And then the shear stress is like the magnetization. So this is like a coexistence region of the Ising model, and it all collapses down to here in that way of looking at it. Yes? So you need a magnetic case, you need a field beyond which you're going to lose you're going to be in the paramagnetic phase. Say, say again. I need a critical H about which you're going to be in a paramagnetic phase, right? There's a critical H and an Ising model? No, 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 no. finite H. H is like gamma dot here. M is like sigma. This is like the, the yield stress is like the equilibrium magnetization. Okay. Okay. All right. And so, having said that, the yield stress is like the equilibrium magnetization model. And then I would expect that this curve should vanish as I approach the jamming transition with some critical exponent. And then phi is like 
phi is like temperature. Right. Okay. Uh, so, given that picture, let me uh, describe what is our scaling offset for this jamming rheology. Rheology just means apply a stress and see how it flows. Okay. Uh, so, let me first sketch out what I'm doing in this problem, and then I will maybe go back to the IZ model where things are maybe a little more familiar to you to show you how things work, and then we'll come back to the J problem. So what are the control parameters? The control parameters delta phi, how far I am from that J packing fraction, point J. Gamma dot, how is the shear strain rate of the line? Another parameter, which we'll come to later, is the size of the system. Right? And so the critical point in principle is when all these parameters match with phi and phi J, gamma dot is zero, the system size is infinite. That's point J, the critical point. Uh, okay. Set. So now what's the hypothesis? This is nothing I'm going to prove or even tell you why it should be, even waving my hands this way or this way. <laughs> and we're just going to say, look, Lou and Nagel told us this should be like a critical point. Let's just test it out. So we'll make the same scaling onsets that you see in second order phase transitions and without worrying why it might be so, we're just going to test it out and see if it works. And what's that scaling onsets? For second order phase transition, it says that at a critical point, all quantities that vanish or diverge do so as some power of a diverging correlation length. So if I have a correlation length in my system and I want to go to some other region of my parameter space in which the correlation length got a factor V times bigger, all such vanishing or diverging quantities should similarly rescale as some power of V. And V is arbitrary. So here, for example, uh, we're going to say that the packing fraction if it's again scaled by V to some power, we'll call that power uh, 1 over nu. The strain rate uh, goes like V to the minus Z. Uh, so again, making the argument that this is like a temperature at any model, this is just the correlation length exponent. Uh, this Z, if gamma dot has the dimensions of 1 over time, this would be like the dynamical exponent of like the driven jam system. L, because it's just a length, it scales like V. Sigma, the stress, scales like V to some power, we'll call it delta over nu. We call it anything, we call it delta over nu. And if you, so, yeah, so that's what I'm saying. So again, what I want to say is, if I am at a system, and my point in my parameter says with a correlation like this C, and I want to go to some other point in my parameter space where the correlation length is B times C. The way I should do that is to take my parameter delta phi and scale it like this much. Take the strain rate where I'm at and change it by scaling it by that much. Uh, system size should scale like that. And when I move to that new point in the parameter space, I will see that the stress has changed by a factor like that. That's the scaling ensembles. And when you put that all together, it just says this. Uh, the stress as a function of the control parameters behaves like this. Scale the distance to the jamming packing fraction so much, the strain rate so much, the system size so much, the stress you get scales so much. Okay? And with that, scaling on stops, we can now do many things. So before I do those many things, because uh, I don't know how people's background is in critical phenomena. And I thought maybe it's worthwhile just to go through a little bit of scaling as applied to the Ising model to show you all the tricks you play that we're going to use here. Okay? So in the Ising model, the parameters are temperature and applied magnetic field. And if F is the free energy density, the free energy per volume, the typical scaling constants that describes the critical point of the Ising model would be something like that. Uh, D is the dimensionality of the system. Little t is just the distance to the critical point. And just like I have some expression here, 
you know, each of these terms has got my scaling factor B times some exponent, and the exponent for P is just like there, 1 over nu, the exponent for H I'll just call 1. <coughs> the overall scaling exponent here is the dimension of the system, because one is making some argument that the total amount of free energy in a correlation volume of the system is some thing proportional to temperature in some non singular way. Okay, so if that's how the free energy behaves, we can look at how the magnetization of the system behaves. Uh, that's just the FDH, and that would be V to the Y minus D, F uh, derivative with respect to H, uh, F P B to the one of the H B to the Y. And I can look at the magnetic susceptibility, which is just the M, the H, and that's B to the 2Y minus B, F of H, two derivatives, C, B to the 1 over U, H, B to the Y. Okay? And now, this parameter B, because of the scaling, could be anything I want it to be. I can choose it to be any number I like. 64, 3, pi, whatever you like. And so I will choose to make it t to the minus nu. So I take this value of v and stick it in everywhere here. And what you find is that m is equal to t to the d minus y nu f the first argument is plus or minus 1, depending upon whether little t is positive or negative, whether I'm above or below tc. And the second argument is h, t, y, u. And I can do the same thing for chi, and I get t to the minus 2y minus d nu, f, y, h, h. H plus or minus 1, H over T to the Y. And from these scaling forms, I can now pop out all the critical exponents that one usually knows about the Ising model. The Ising model, if I plot the equilibrium magnetization at zero magnetic field, it just does something like that. vanishing as you get to Tc with some power beta. So if I set H equal to zero, this is just a constant. And that tells me what this critical exponent beta is in terms of these two scaling exponents in the one. And again, at H equal zero, at Tc, the magnetic susceptibility diverges with some exponent, okay, to the minus gamma. And so if I again set h equal to zero here and just I can read off gamma is two y minus d nu. Okay? And so I now have gamma in terms of these scaling parameters. Uh, what else? We don't need this anymore. But I didn't have to choose B like that. I could choose B differently too. I could choose B such that B is H to the minus 1 over Y. That's okay too. And when I do that, what that's going to do is make the second argument here a constant. And so when I do that, I get M is H to the D minus Y over uh, Y, F H of T over H to the 1 over Y nu, 1, and uh, if I look at that exactly, at the critical point where little t is zero, 
then what this is is constant. And so m scales is a power of the magnetic field, and that power is typically called 1 over delta. So the delta is y over d minus h. So again, all the typical critical exponents that are defined, you can get just by knowing these two critical exponents, two critical scaling exponents <coughs> of the parameters of the system. Okay. Uh, one other thing to say. Uh, let's go back to the more general form here. We define beta by putting h equal 0, but there's no reason I have to put h equal to 0. I could leave it. And what this tells me now is if I, uh, OK, that is beta. If I knew my value of the critical temperature Tc, and I knew the value of the scaling exponents, and so I know beta. Then if I took my data, I measured the magnetization at various points in the TH plane, two-dimensional parameter space. But if I take the data and plot it like this, m over little t to the beta versus h over little t to the y nu, all the data in that two-dimensional parameter space will collapse to a single curve in one dimension. Okay? And so this is known as a scaling function or a scaling curve. And I could do the same thing here. If you like, look at this one. And if I plot an m over h to the d minus y over y versus t over h to the 1 over y nu, similarly, I would find that all the data collapse to a universal curve like that. OK. Uh, so that's scaling. And what we're going to do here is a very similar thing. We're going to measure stress as a function of packing fraction and strain rate and see if we can uh, determine critical exponents and the value of phi j to make all the data in that two-dimensional parameter space collapse to a single scaling curve. And if it does, then we say eureka. The data scales like point j really is a critical point. Uh, OK, there's one more thing I want to do here back in the Ising model. Again, hopefully we'll get to it in the talk. Oh, let me write it here. This is v to the y minus d. As I already mentioned here, there's actually one more scaling parameter, and that's the size of the system. If your system is so big that we don't worry about it being finite, then we drop it. And that's what we'll be doing in the first set of data I'll show you. But really, you shouldn't do that. You should make use of the fact that things depend on the size of the system. And do what's called finite size scaling. And so when I do finite size scaling, what I'll do is take this scaling parameter, which could be anything, I choose it to be the size of my system. And then I can write B is L to the Y minus D. T to the L one over nu. H L to the Y one. To make life simple, let me say H equals zero. And so that's zero. And so M is just L to the Y minus T, some scaling function. T L to the 1 over nu. And so if I had my data for M for different equilibrium magnetization, for different sizes at different uh, temperatures, if I divided M by L to the Y minus D, I would see that all my data curves for different sizes L intersected at the critical temperature. Because that's where the argument here always vanishes, no matter what L is. And then the slopes of the curves there would allow me to get new. 
Or another way to see that, let me put the L Y to the minus E back there. At T equal T C, this is zero. The magnetization, which is zero for a thermodynamic system, a finite system, the magnetization at the critical temperature isn't zero, but it scales to zero as a power of the system size. Okay, so this is the basics of finite size scaling, which we'll come to later. All right. It depends on how you want to define it. Yes, so there are people who say, let me define the critical temperature of my finite size system to be where some measured quantity has some feature, like where the specific heat has its maximum, and so on. But, you know, a finite size system has no critical behavior. So this is sort of arbitrary. So the way I'm presenting it here, you're really thinking of the critical temperature being the true infinite size system of critical temperature. And then all these quantities, temperature, field, and system size, are parameters that take you away from it. So a finite size system is taking you away from the true critical point. And in that sense, the scaling as described here is about the true critical point where system size is a parameter that takes you there. So I don't want to mess around with finite size critical points, which really aren't necessarily well unambiguously defined. Okay. So here's our scaling law. Like that. And I'm going to do just what I told you. For the first part of the talk, we'll imagine my system is so big that I'm in the thermodynamic limit. What that really means is that I can't take my data too close to the critical point because as I get to the critical point, if there's no correlation rate diverging, it will ultimately get bigger than the size of my system and I'll see finite size effects. Okay? So in my finite size system, L is really big, I can get close to the critical point, but I really, really get at the critical point. And now I'll do the same things I did here. I'll choose B to be delta 5 to minus U. Pop it in here. You got an expression like that. And if I evaluate it at gamma dot equal zero, I find this is just like m goes to t to the beta. The yield stress goes like the distance and packing fraction to point j to the delta. So this parameter delta, which you didn't know what it was when I wrote the scaling equation down, now you know what it was. It's that exponent which determines how the yield stress vanishes. I can also do what I did on this board, choose v like this, so that this term becomes a constant, and then I get a scaling equation like that. Let me get rid of that guy. All right. And what I'll do here is, again, I'll take this, divide through, and when I plot my data like this versus this, all the two-dimensional data, sigma as a function of phi gamma dot, should collapse to a single scaling curve. Okay. And it our first attempt to do that was published in PRL in 207, although the language is quite different in that paper from what I'm telling you right now. Okay, let me just do something a little different. Let me talk about the scaling of the shear viscosity. Here's my scaling equation for the stress. The shear viscosity material is defined to be the stress over the strain rate. So if I just divide this by the strain rate, I can write a scaling law like that. And then the viscosity exponent, which we call beta, can be defined like this. As I, here's my jamming phase diagram. As I sit at gamma dot vanishingly small and increase phi to get to phi j, the viscosity diverges in some way as a power law. And, and that power law is beta. And I see that beta is now uh, minus uh, z nu minus delta. Okay? So all I'm doing here is I'm going to reparameterize this combination z nu in terms of delta, which we know its meaning, and beta, which we know physically what its meaning here is in terms of viscosity diverging. And then the scaling law that look like that now looks like that. And then what follows, I'll just do this. So all I'm doing is changing the names. Instead of using the new, I'm introducing something called it. That's all. Uh, okay. Oops, did I? Uh, okay, 
So we're going to again try to plot this versus this and see if the data collapses to a scaling curve. Okay. So I'm doing numerical simulations. Okay. And the model of the granular material we'll take is one that's been well studied in this field by many others. It's a bi-dispersed mixture of soft disks in two dimensions at zero temperatures, equal numbers of disks with a ratio of diameters of 1.4. We'll take a frictionless harmonic soft core. So as particles push into each other, they repel proportional to the square of the overlap. You could take other parameters or other power laws to be more realistic, but we just take this simple one. Uh, we're going to shear it. Okay? Physically, or technically, the way we implement shearing in our system uh, is through a boundary condition. Okay? When you do most statistical mechanical systems and you do a finite size system and you want the finite size effects to be as small as possible, you use periodic boundary conditions. Things down here match on to things up here. But when I want to stress the system, so here's a system in which I strained it by a factor gamma, I want sort of my unit cell of this periodic system to be a rhombus like that. So I empirically, periodically replicate, replicate this system. So particles down here will interact with their images, not directly above, but shift it over like that. Okay? And this is known as Lee's Edwards boundary conditions, the same Edwards that we saw yesterday. And now I need to tell you a dynamics for my particles. And again, we took the very simplest sort of dynamics we could choose. I mean, other people do more involved dynamics, which has basically Newton's equations with some damping and so on. We're going to take an overdamped dynamic. So the velocity of a particle at position Ri, it's just going to be proportional to the applied force on the system. So this is the force driven the soft core potential. And what it's going to do, if it's not forced, it's going to relax to the average velocity of where it sits. So when I'm applying a finite strain rate, the average velocity is this linear velocity profile that's proportional to the strain rate, so that's this y gamma dot. That's the average velocity of the system at high y. And so I'm just saying the particle will relax to that average velocity unless it feels a force and then it moves with regard to that. This is really an approximation. Really what I should do here is replace this by the velocities of the particles it's really the particle I is in contact with, because that's where it's dissipating the energy. So this is a simplifying approximation that was introduced by Doug Durian when he was actually modeling foams. Okay, so this is actually a very good model of foams. And what we'll do is measure the pressure tensor. This is the same as the stress tensor uh, that I spoke about yesterday. Uh, here I call it the pressure tensor. So here, R, dB, dr is a force, and R times F, that's the stress. And... What's Y mean? I missed that. Say again? What's Y, I missed that. Y, I is the height of particle I. X direction is here, Y direction is here. Yes? We have velocities and kinetic energy for, for all parts. So Say again? So the kinetic energy. No. In this model, the dynamics is overdamped, so there are no inertial terms in the dynamic. Uh, we're assuming the kinetic energy is always damped out really quickly to some other degrees of freedom. Where, so you might imagine that these particles are in some very viscous fluid or something like that. Okay? Certainly, other people want to make the more realistic model of real grains put in kinetic energy. Okay? But we're not going to here. All right, if I measure the strain tensor, I can get the shear stress from the off-diagonal element, I get the pressure from the diagonal elements, and I can also compute the average energy, interaction energy of my system. And just to tell you what parameters we're doing, and the data that I'll show you now, uh, strain rate is fixed, the stress is going to fluctuate in time, we have 65,000 particles, that's a lot of particles, and we're looking for a collapse of the data to such a form. And the way you're going to collapse to that in various ways. You can just twiddle parameters and stop when you're happy. That's not a good way, in my opinion. In my opinion, you want to have some systematic method that doesn't depend on your eyeball being happy. Uh, because if you have a systematic method, then you can vary things and test if the fit you have is really statistically significant in a way. Uh, 
because you might find many different parameters to make the data look like this. So what we're going to do is take the scaling function here, and about point j, if gamma dot is finite, this argument is zero, and this function is presumably an analytical function of this argument. And so we're going to take our data to small values here, expand that scaling function as a polynomial, where we don't know what the polynomial coefficients are, and I'll fit the data to some form like this, where I have lots of unknown parameters, delta, beta, the coefficients of the polynomial expansion, phi j. Uh, all those are unknown parameters, and I just do some nonlinear fitting of my data to that and get the parameters. Okay? And then I can see if I narrow the window of my data that I'm using and fit again, do those parameters stay the same? Do they change? If I take a higher order polynomial, do the parameters stay the same, or do they change? These are tests you can make to see that your fit really is significant. And from that, so we're going to determine the values of phi j and the critical exponents delta and beta. And again, this assumes finite size effects are negligible, so we're never getting too close to phi j. Uh, I was just wondering, I had a question about simulation. How do you make your initial ensemble, and does it matter at all? Like, do the yes. initial conditions so, make a difference? Yes. So here, what we do is we start with an initial condition, which generally is random. We shear it for a little while, and then we take that as the initial condition. And to the best of our knowledge, no, it doesn't matter what the starting point was. And when you're shearing it, so, so this is unlike the compression kind of experiments where you squeeze it and it sits still. Here we're doing something physically to the systems that really is forcing it to explore its configuration space. Is, is and, and, 5J like very well defined in the system? So before we had this isotesticity yes, yes. requirement, but now you have a harmonic potential, so it seems like it's a little bit uh, more... No, no, the isotesticity did not... It also applied to soft force. It wasn't mm -hmm. only for rigid force. So phi j is still the point where all the force and balance and the pressure is zero, and then it will increase as I compress it further. <coughs> but the point I'm trying to make here is that as I shear it, I am really making the system go through lots of different states, and I'm averaging over those states. I'm not just picking them out of a hat somehow. It's a real physical process here. And we'll see at the end, if I get to the end, that it makes a difference. Uh, Okay, well, maybe I'll show this just for fun. Uh, just to prove that we really did this, here's a picture of our simulation. The red particles are colored just so you can see them move. They're not indifferent or special. And where it stops and then starts again, that's just to the end of the run and then looping back. All right, so look for this on YouTube. <laughs> and now... So, here's our data, wonderful data. Shear stress versus packing fraction for a range of strain rates uh, going over, well, three orders of magnitude, yeah? down to 10 to the minus 8, which is extremely small. Uh, and as you see, for any finite strain rate, the shear stress doesn't go to zero in any pattern. It just goes and gets smaller. And as the strain rate gets smaller and smaller, it sharpens up. And in the limit that gamma that went to zero, I would get some curve, which is just the yield stress vanishing at some critical five. Right? So what I want to do now is see if I can collapse the data. And I use that procedure I told you about of fitting to a polynomial. And uh, restricting my data to some of the smaller values of the strain rate, so I'm close to the proof point, so I'm neglecting these bigger rates, top five. I can get an excellent scale collapse in the system by the particles uh, with a value of J density of 0.843 uh, and delta and beta like that. And what order polynomial did you use for that? Thing? Oh, I think it was four. Uh, it's not too sensitive. Uh, really, third order. Uh, 
All right. So everything is wonderful, and then you can ask why haven't we already published this result? And that's because if you look more carefully, things aren't entirely wonderful. Uh, so it's what I said before. Question. Yeah, so why do you neglect the I'm going to tell you that right now. Okay, so the reason why I neglect my, why I might want to like neglect larger strain rates is the scaling that I'm looking for holds in principle only about some finite small region of the critical point, and I don't a priori know how big is that critical region. All right? And if I include data that's outside that critical region, my scaling really won't work. I'll see deviations. I have to put in corrections to scaling and things like that. Uh, so I want to get close to the point. So here I just threw out some of the data farther from the critical point. Remember, increasing gamma dot takes you away from the jamming transition. But I can do exactly sort of what you're suggesting here and what I said. I want to test that this fit is significant. <coughs> And one way I can do that is vary the window of my data to see if the parameters change or not. So here, you know, I threw away all this data. What if I didn't throw it away? What if I kept some of it and did the same fit? What if I throw away even more of the data? How do these parameters change? And so what we see, in fact, is uh, this axis here is the maximum value of the strain rate used in doing the fit like that. And here is 10 to the 5, which is, I think, this one and everything below. And here is 2 times 10 to the 7, which is, I think, just these. And as you see, as I keep decreasing the value of gamma dot, the biggest value that I'm using, this fitted value of the jamming density is changing systematically. It's getting bigger. Okay? And, well, okay, whoops, what is it? And you could say, well, what's the difference between 0.8426 and 0.8432? Between the trends, that's not very much. But the point is, it's a systematic change, and if I look at how these exponent beta changes, that is more significant, from about 1.85 to 2.25. You really want to just control that. Just I would love it to plateau, yeah? And then I'm done. So this is why it hasn't been published. <laughs> Question. Presumably you also have some goodness of fit information. Yes. And as you yes. say, if you go outside of yes. what it's supposed to fit. So actually if I fit, uh, including data with gamma dot bigger than 10 to the minus 6, this goodness of fit parameter is very bad. And as I go below 10 to the minus 6, it becomes reasonable. So that's the problem, is that from 10 to 6 down, it's not, not, the, not, not the other that's, thing. That's right. That's right. That's right. Okay. So there are various things to play with here. How one could try to fix it up, either get the smaller gamma dot, and it might be bigger system sizes, or add what's called corrections to scaling, or worry about if the scaling parameters that I've chosen are really the right ones, because there might be nonlinear corrections to the scaling parameters that you like. Uh, but that's the state of this project. So and instead, we took a different direction. Is there a question? Yes. Just a quick one. Uh, so, how does these th conclusions change when you actually do a finite size scaling? Does it that's what I'm going to tell you now. Oh. All right. So, uh, if my gamma dot is too big, I should go to that curve point by making gamma dot smaller. And in fact, what I want to do now is tell you about quasi static simulation, in which gamma dot is really going to zero. But if gamma dot is going to zero, I'm really at the critical point, if phi is the right number, and I told you, when I get right to the critical point, the correlation length is infinite, and finite size effects are there, and so now I want to take advantage of them. So I want to do finite size scaling like I described here for the Ising model. So first, what, are, what do I mean by quasi-static simulations? Instead of using that dynamical equation of motion, I'm going to do something different. Uh, when the strain rate is sufficiently slow, you can assume that the system will always relax to a instantaneous local minimum. Because that time it takes to relax is always uh, shorter than the rate at which I'm changing the strain. And so that's what we're going to do. Instead of that 
equa dynamic equation I wrote, we're just going to increase the strain in fixed steps of size delta gamma, small. And each step, I'll use a conjugate gradient method or your favorite minimization method to find the local energy minimum. And then I'll sit there, and then I'll increase delta gamma again and minimize again. And those minimized states, as I vary gamma, are the states that I average over to compute my quantities. And that will then be sort of this quasi-static unit. And this has been done by other people in uh, various ways. And so here's an example of what you get out. Here is the, this is for 512 particles, uh, very well right about what we think is the jamming transition. This is showing the interaction energy versus the strain as we keep straining the system. And what you see is it's, you know, very spiky like that. There are some regions where the stress or the energy density is very small or zero. Remember, that's an unjammed state where it's flowing. And then it flows and then it jams up. And the energy builds up and then I breaks free and comes back down and you get stuff like that. If I look at a higher uh, packing fashion, this is into the jammed state, I no longer see any of those regions where the stress uh, where the energy is finite. I'm always uh, having some elastic like response and the uh, energy varies about something that's uh, like that. Okay. So, uh, okay. so just to show you what I showed you before with my simulation. Here's real data from Berenger. It's the concentric cylinder experiment. And he's measuring stress. This is basically the derivative of the curve I showed you. And, uh, well, you see, he's doing it for finite strain rates. This is bigger, getting smaller. And you see the same kind of behavior. The regions where it flows pretty smoothly, and then it locks up, and then it breaks free, and so on. So, real life really is doing that. Okay, so now I want to do finite size scaling. L is the square root of number of particles. Here is my scaling equation that we've been using so far. If I want to do finite size scaling, I just have to change it by adding the system size as a scaling variable. Take B equal L, okay, for the quantum static limit, gamma dot is going to be zero. And so the scaling equation I'm looking for is now like that. Uh, exactly at the jamming transition, this is zero. Sigma vanishes at the jamming transition as a power of the system size. That's the same thing like here. The equilibrium magnetization vanishes at PC by the power of the system size. And in general, what I'll do is I'll bring this to the other side and try and plot my data, sigma times L to that power, versus delta phi times L to that power. And if I can collapse my data, I will get my critical exponents delta, and also now nu. That's a new one. Uh, that's the correlation length exponent. One thing very nice about finite size scaling is it lets you get the correlation length exponent without having to explicitly measure the correlation length which in these systems is a hard thing to do. Again, I'll fit my data to polynomial expansion the scaling function uh, like I did before, and if things work, they work. All right. Uh, so here's some data in that quasi-static limit. Shear stress versus packing fraction for different system sizes, 64 particles per 1,000 particles. Uh, I'm plotting the same data now a different way. Uh, this data is stress versus packing fraction for different numbers of particles. Here it's stress versus number of particles for different <coughs> packing fractions. And this down here is a smaller packing fraction going to higher packing fractions. And what I said was that if I'm exactly at the critical packing fraction, this relation between stress and system size is a power law. So what I want to do is look for the best power law. There's a log log plot. So the straightest line here separates things below jamming so you can kind of see that that's not, that's plausible. Uh, again, I'm fitting to that. Uh, and I do my fit, and the fitted function that I get, that polynomial would fit the data like this, so it's doing pretty well. And the scale and collapse I get is pretty well. And it determines phi j, which was in the same ballpark as the other results. Delta is the same ballpark as the other results. It's the new exponent. Uh, and that value of 0.7 has been seen in other sorts of simulations other people have done. Uh, 
What I measured there was the stress. Well, I could also measure other quantities which vanish at the uh, jamming transition. Energy density vanishes, pressure vanishes. I can do the same game. Uh, so energy should vanish as phi goes to phi j with some parameter, I'll call it y u. And so that gives a finite size scaling function for the energy density like that. Pressure should vanish as I go to phi j with some power y p, and that gives some finite size scaling relation to the pressure. And because p is related to u just by derivative with respect to packing fraction, y p should be y u minus 1. And so now I do it. I do an independent fit to my energy data like this, try to collapse it, and I get a nice collapse with parameters like that. And I take the pressure, I do the same thing, I collapse it independently of everything else, and I get parameters like that. And I'll just uh, summarize it here. So results of this finite size scaling with n going to 64 to 1,000 particles. Phi j is determined by the stresses. That should be 0 0.8 to 0. 0.8429, 0. 0.846, 0. 0.843. So these are in pretty good agreement. This is a little bit off. But given the uncertainties, they are in rough agreement, which is what I want. You know, all things should vanish at the same packing fraction if that's really a consistent description. Here's nu. And within the estimated statistical error, they are all the same, about 0.7. And here's delta. Okay, that's what we saw. Yu is 2.5, Yp is 1.3. And again, within the estimated error, Yp is Yu minus 1. So everything looks good. Okay, so again, if I wanted to, we should have published this, but there's a reason why not yet. Uh, because the same thing applies, the same problem applies here as applied in the other simulations where I kept shrinking gamma dot to get to the critical point. Uh, it's the same thing here. If my system size is too small, the critical scaling won't work. My system has to get big enough. So to check that my fits are statistically uh, significant, I should take data from my smaller system size and throw it away and fit again and see what I get. And if I do that, I'll fit now only to 128, 2000. Here's the result. The stress, energy, pressure, phi j moves up a little bit, but is roughly the same. This last row here, they don't change at all. The correlation length exponent goes up. Okay, get the error goes up, so I could say, well, it's statistically the same as that, but really there seems to be a systematic increase in it. And what that's about, I'm not sure. Uh, just to compare it to other people's claims of what the correlation of the should be, uh, calculation by these guys based on the soft elastic modes of the jam solid said nu should be a heck. That doesn't seem to be what we find. Uh, Another group of papers found nu equal to 0 0.7. That's fine with what we see. If I use that result. And then another calculation mapping this problem to a spin glass by Mike Moore actually gives nu is 0.78, which is even better. So the verdict is still out. You know, really what we want to do is go to bigger system sizes and see if things plateau. If they do, we're done. If they don't, we're in trouble. Uh, okay. And now I'll tell you one last thing. That will take two minutes. Uh, there was a lot of discussion in previous lectures and also whether how I prepare my system really makes a difference. Is this phi j a well-defined thing or not? So I'm here finding a phi j uh, from my shearing which is a perfectly well-defined physical process. Uh, but other people have done it through other means, compression. So uh, one very seminal work in the field, by Kern et al. and PRE, they did the following procedure. They started with some uh, configuration chosen at random, and then they relaxed that configuration to its nearest energy minimum. And if that energy is finite, they say that state is jammed. If that energy is negligibly small, below some threshold, they say that state is unjammed. And you then repeat this process, choosing all 
initial state was <coughs> completely random. And for a given size system, you can plot then as a function of packing fraction, what's the fraction of states at a given packing fraction which turn out to be jammed. And the curve they get is like this. And so if I took as an estimate of you know, my five days for this 256 number of particles, I might put it where half the states are jammed. So that's some point here. We can do the same thing in our system. We have our, let's take the quasi-static uh, simulation. As I look at that ensemble of states I'm averaging over, I can see, you know, is the energy finite? That state is jammed. If the energy is negligibly small, that state is unjammed. As I shear my system at a fixed packing fraction, what's the fraction of states which are jammed? That's this curve, noticeably displaced over. And it's phi j is higher. And I can also do things in between. Uh, that was the quasi-static sharing that gamma dot goes to zero. I can also imagine sharing my system at a finite strain rate, and then stopping every so often and letting the system relax to its energy minimum. And when I do that, I get all these curves in between. The curve farthest to the left is at a fast strain rate, and the curve to the right is the slow strain rate. So it seems that this jamming uh, depends on the sort of configurations you sample over. And choosing things completely at random and letting them relax is the same as shearing it at a very fast rate and letting it relax. But it's different than shearing it very slowly. And in fact, O'Hearn has a new workout in which he explicitly shows that if you shear a system and you start at random configurations, after time, all those initially random configurations settle into a much smaller subset configurations, and so the ensembles are not the same. And one last thing you can ask, this 5J, which we see different, is 256 particles. Well, does that stay the same? Is there still a difference as N gets bigger, or does it shrink together? And so that's the last picture, is just to show this is the random initial configuration, okay. and this is the quasi-static shearing, and it doesn't appear that they are approaching the same number. Okay, so this is then a word of caution that uh, how you, what protocol you're using to make your ensemble can affect things. And that's not to say one protocol is better than another. You will have to choose the one that describes your physical uh, process. Uh, okay, so that's it. Why is this in fail also is because of the size of the critical region. If you're away from it and yes. in the jam state, then you kind of expect that this dependence on the preparation and rates will be there because it's a more classic state. Right. right. But so you, is there any clue of how big the critical region itself is? Uh, I think if you're talking about the packing fraction, it seems that that, I mean, we haven't really systematically tested it. Uh, if you're talking about strain rate or system size, well, strain rate we saw has to be really rather small. And system size, we don't know yet how big. No, no, I mean the critical region. The in the packing region. fraction, five. Yeah. yeah. So that's not really been tested. In all our data, we use a very narrow region. So from about 0.82 to 0.85. You know, other people choose much bigger regions, and I don't like that. But, but I don't, we don't have any systematic test yet of how big that critical region uh, really is. I mean, it also depends on system size, right? The smaller system size is, you can use a wider range of data, but that's right. Uh, we don't really have any systematic measure of that yet. And the 0.7 number, that's just uh, simulations, right? The one that's is correct. Okay, so there is no theoretical. There is no theory, theory gave half, right? Huh? Theory gave half or something, right? That's what one theory gave a half. Yes. You choose. Yes. Um, did you ever look in your jam states at an order parameter, like a bond orientation parameter or something? An order parameter like a bond orientation parameter. No, we have not done that. 
So um, could it be that the sheared versus random initial conditions might have something to do with this MRJ, MRJ point that Torpedo talks about, that maybe you're looking at a slightly more rigid state? Or one or the other is a slightly more The way I don't know. I mean, well, possibly, you know, I mean, he's looking at all possible jam states, so certainly preparing it differently could take you different places. The way I look at it is this uh, way of preparing it where you start at a completely random initial configuration and then you just go to the local energy minimum. That's not really a very physical way in some sense. I suspect uh, you might wind up in a lot of energy minimums which aren't really seen in real life. How do I want to say that? I mean, that's like starting at infinite temperature and quenching strength to t equals zero. I could do something different. I could try to take my system and equilibrate it at a finite temperature and then quench it to zero. And I might expect that the ensemble I get depends on that equilibration temperature. Uh, in glasses, that certainly is fine. So I think what the shearing does is sort of gives you a bunch of states in which the density of particles is more uniformly distributed than you might be getting with the other way of preparing it. And that's what the difference is about. But this is still all stuff not really understood. Yeah. He started by drawing an analogy of rising model, yeah. which is basically a one to one on Is there oh, is, is it a matter of luck or just does one expect does one expect it to do like that or it's just uh, so, so first of all, this analogy is strictly by, you know, it's not based on any deep thought. I mean, it's just by looking at the phase diagram, what well, is phase diagram, looks like that phase diagram. And when I do that, then I see that it is a sigma, that's the analog of M, and gamma dot, that's the analog of uh, H. And did I, was it luck or did I know that? I mean, the truth is, when we first did this, I didn't really think it was that way at all. I thought the sigma should be the analog of H. And uh, because that's the parameter I turn on in my lab, I force it. Uh, I'm not sure it really makes a difference. You know, the scaling laws are the same. So I, I don't know the answer to whether it's luck. I mean, it may be that this analogy breaks down when you probe it more. Exactly. You know, they're saying the yield stress is like an order parameter. Well, in other ways, does it behave like an order parameter? I write on M. L. Ginsburg's like theory of fluctuations, which yield stress is like an order parameter. I guess spatial distribution of well, you know, I don't know. You know it says it's done yet. So if it's not the technology, then the scaling ansatz is also an approximation. Well, the scaling ansatz is an ansatz. I mean, it's not coming from anywhere. I'm just saying, let me make it and see if the data fits it. It's the same thing in equilibrium systems. I mean, people noticed that data had scaling, and it was only later with renormalization group techniques that they justified where that scaling came from. So I'm not trying to tell you where the scaling comes from, or to tell you, but I'm just looking to see if it's there, and it seems to be there. And because it's there, if things work out well, I can say, well, maybe it is behaving like a critical point, and then some smarter people can try and say why it's like that. Just to add a comment, I mean, the Ising scaling is the generic situation for two scaling fields. Um, so that's really the relevance of the correspondence. Yes, yeah, so I have two scaling. Yes, exactly. exactly. Right. <coughs> so again, on, on the Ising model, yeah. uh, in your simulation, you have uh, this two sizes, yeah. so you try uh, to map it back to the Ising model, it seems like there would be spins of two different magnitudes. How, how would that change the fit? I, I'm not getting that deep into the analogy to worry about that. Okay? You could do the same thing in 3D with model dispersed particles, and it works pretty well. So, I don't Maybe to not there in various structure simulation, but is there any way you can subdivide the whole system into smaller systems? Yeah. Look, for example, in stress yeah. stress correlation system. Yeah, so we want to do that. <laughs> but we haven't done it yet. <laughs> um, these exponents that you find, they yeah. must be universal in some way. Well, maybe not. Kind of 
when you're comparing it to that, yeah. yeah. half, that would be a different universal size. Uh, no, the people who do, okay, so, the people who have done this, this kind of uh, other ensemble that I described, choose things at random, relax it to its local minimum, and look at things like that. Or choose something at random, relax it to its local minimum, and then compress or expand it until you find that configuration, this particular jamming pattern. <coughs> Those people in the calculations do find the following. The exponent nu is a half and doesn't depend on anything. Other exponents that they have seem to depend on what's the force law of the soft core potential. So if I say using a harmonic potential, I use a Hertzian potential, which is overlap to the power of five halves. Then things depend on that power in some systematic way. The other thing that is odd here in those calculations, uh, in ordinary equilibrium critical phenomena, critical exponents depend very much on dimensionality of the system. And they don't depend on the force laws, which are problems. Here they seem to depend on the force laws and don't depend on the dimensionality of the system. So in 2 and 3D, exponents don't look any different in those set of calculations. Okay, whether that will be true in our kind of calculations, we don't have to know. So there's still a lot of open things here. I think in view of the time, maybe we should hold any further questions you can ask. Uh, see, I personally, and thank you again for.